Good evening and welcome back to Booked for the Night. I'm Melissa Phillips and tonight I'm reading chapters 25 through 27 of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Enjoy. Chapter 25 It was a deluge of a winter in the Salinas Valley, wet and wonderful. The rains fell gently and soaked in and did not fresh it. The feed was deep in January. And in February, the hills were fat with grass and the coats of the cattle looked tight and sleek. In March, the soft rains continued, and each storm waited courteously until its predecessors sank beneath the ground. Then warmth flooded the valley and the earth burst into bloom, yellow and blue and gold. Tom was alone on the ranch, and even that dust heap was rich and lovely and the flints were hidden in grass and the Hamilton cows were fat, and the Hamilton sheep sprouted grass from their damp backs. At noon on March 15th, Tom sat on the bench outside the forge. The sunny morning was over, and gray water-bearing clouds sailed in over the mountains from the ocean, and their shadows slid under them on the bright earth. Tom heard a horse's clattering hoofs, and he saw a small boy, elbows flapping, urging a tired horse toward the house. He stood up and walked toward the road. The boy galloped up to the house, yanked off his hat, flung a yellow envelope on the ground, spun his horse around, and kicked up a gallop again. Tom started to call after him, and then he leaned wearily down and picked up the telegram. He sat in the sun on the bench outside the forge, holding the telegram in his hand. And he looked at the hills in the old house, as though to save something, before he tore open the envelope and read the inevitable four words, the person, the event, and the time. Tom slowly folded the telegram and folded it again and again until it was a square no larger than his thumb. He walked to the house, through the kitchen, through the lo little living room, and into his bedroom. He took his dark suit out of the clothes press and laid it over the back of a chair, and he put a white shirt and a black tie on the seat of the chair. And then he lay down on the bed and turned his face to the wall. The Surreys and the Buggies had driven out of the Salinas Cemetery. The family and friends went back to Olive's house on Central Avenue to eat and to drink coffee, to see how each one was taking it, and to do and say the decent things. George offered Adam Trask a lift in his rented Surrey, but Adam refused. He wandered around the cemetery and sat down on the cement curb of the Williams family plot. The traditional dark cypresses wept around the edge of the cemetery, and white violets ran wild in the pathways. Someone had brought them in, and they had become weeds. The cold wind blew over the tombstones and cried in the cypresses. There were many cast iron stars, marking the graves of grand army men, and on each star a small wind-bitten flag from a year ago, Decoration Day. Adam sat looking at the mountains to the east of Salinas with a noble point of Fremont's peak dominating. The air was crystalline as it sometimes is when rain is coming, and then the light be rain began to blow on the wind, although the sky was not properly covered with cloud. Adam had come up on the morning train. He had not intended to come at all, but something drew him beyond his power to resist. For one thing, he could not believe that Samuel was dead. He could hear the rich, lyric voice in his ears, the tones rising and falling in their foreignness, and the curious music of oddly chosen words tripping out so that you were never sure what the next word would be. In the speech of most men, you are absolutely sure what the next word will be. Adam had looked at Samuel in his casket and knew that he didn't want him to be dead. And since the face in the casket did not look like Samuel's face, Adam walked away to be by himself and to preserve the man alive. He had to go to the cemetery. Custom would have been outraged else, but he stood well back where he could not hear the words. And when the suns filled the grave, he had walked away and strolled in the paths where the white violets grew. The cemetery was deserted and the dark crooning of the wind bowed, bowed the heavy cypress trees. The rain droplets grew larger and drove stinging along. Adam stood up, shivered, and walked slowly over the white violets and past the new grave. The flowers had been laid evenly to cover the mound of new-turned damp earth, and already the wind had frayed the blossoms and flung the smaller bouquets out into the path. Adam picked them up and laid them back on the mound. He walked out of the cemetery. 
The wind and the rain were at his back, and he ignored the wetness that soaked through his black coat. Romy Lane was muddy with pools of water standing in the new wheel ruts, and the tall wild oats and mustard grew beside the road, with wild turnip forcing its boisterous way up, and stickery beads of purple thistles rising above the green riot of the wet spring. The black doe <clears throat> mud covered Adam's shoes and splashed the bottoms of his dark trousers. It was nearly a mile to the Monterey Road. Adam was dirty and soaking when he reached it and turned east into the town of Salinas. The water was standing in the curved brim of his derby hat and his collar was wet and sagging. At John Street, the road angled and became Main Street. Adam stamped the mud off his shoes when he reached the pavement. The buildings cut the wind from him and almost instantly he began to shake with a chill. He increased his speed. Near the other end of Main Street, he turned into the Abbott House Bar. He ordered brandy and drank it quickly, and his shivering increased. Mr. Lapierre, behind the bar, saw the chill. You'd better have another one, he said. You'll get a bad cold. Would you like a hot rum? That will knock it out of you. Yes, I would, said Adam. Well, here, you sip another cognac while I get some hot water. Adam took his glass to a table and sat uncomfortably in his wet clothes. Mr. Lapierre brought a steaming kettle from the kitchen. He put the squat glass on a tray and brought it to the table. Drink it as hot as you can stand it, he said. That will shake the chill out of an aspen. He drew a chair up, sat down, then stood up. You've made me cold, he said. I'm going to have one myself. He brought his glass back to the table and sat across from Adam. It's working, he said. You were so pale you scared me when you came in. You're a stranger? I'm from near King City, Adam said. Come up for the funeral? Yes. He was an old friend. Big funeral? Oh, yes. I'm not surprised. He had lots of friends. Too bad it couldn't have been a nice day. You ought to have one more and then go to bed. I will, said Adam. It makes me comfortable and peaceful. Well, that's worth something. Might have saved you from pneumonia, too. After he had served another toddy, he brought a damp cloth from behind the bar. You can wipe off some of that mud, he said. A funeral isn't very gay, but when it gets rained on, that's really mournful. It didn't rain until after, said Adam. I, it was walking back I got wet. Why don't you get a nice room right here? You get into bed and I'll send a toddy up to you, and in the morning you'll be fine. I think I'll do that, said Adam. He could feel the blood stinging his cheeks and running hotly in his arms, as though it were some foreign warm fluid taking over his body. Then the warmth melted through into the cold concealed box where he stored forbidden thoughts, and the thoughts came timidly up to the surface like children who do not know whether they will be received. Adam picked up the damp cloth and leaned down to sponge off the bottoms of his trousers. The blood pounded behind his eyes. I might have one more toddy, he said. Mr. Lapierre said, If it's for cold, you've had enough. But if you just want a drink, I've got some old Jamaica rum. I'd rather you have that straight. It's 50 years old. The water would kill the flavor. I just want a drink, said Adam. I'll have one with you. I haven't opened that jug in months. Not much call for it. This is a whiskey drinking town. Adam wiped off his shoes and dropped the cloth on the floor. He took a drink of the dark rum and coughed. The heavy muscled drink wrapped its sweet aroma around his head and struck at the base of his nose like a blow. The room seemed to tip sideways and then right itself. Good, isn't it? Mr. Lapierre asked. But it can knock you over. I wouldn't have more than one, unless, of course, you want to get knocked over. Some do. Adam leaned his elbows on the table. He felt a garrulousness coming on him, and he was frightened at the impulse. His voice did not sound like his voice, and his words amazed him. I don't get up here much, he said. Do you know a place called Kate's? Jesus, that rum is better than I thought, Mr. Lapierre said, and he went on sternly. You live on a ranch? Yes, got a place near King City. My name's Trask. Glad to meet you. Married? No, not now. Widower? Yes. 
You go to Jenny's. Let Kate alone. That's not good for you. Jenny's is right next door. You go there and you'll get everything you need. Right next door? Sure. You go east a block and a half and a turn right. Anybody tell you where the line is? Adam's tongue was getting thick. What's the matter with Kate's? You go to Jenny's, said Mr. LaPierre. It was a dirty, gusty evening. Castroville Street was deep in sticky mud, and Chinatown was so flooded that its inhabitants had laid planks across the narrow street that separated their hutches. The clouds against the evening sky were the gray of rats, and the air was not damp, but dank. I guess the difference is that dampness comes down, but dankness rises up out of rot and fermentation. The afternoon wind had dropped away and left the air raw and wounded. It was cold enough to shake out the curtains of rum in Adam's head without restoring his timidity. He walked quickly down the unpaved sidewalks, his eyes on the ground to avoid stepping in puddles. The row was dimly lit by the warning lantern where the railroad crossed the street and by one small carbon filamented globe that burned on the porch of Jenny's. Adam had his instructions. He counted two houses and nearly missed the third, so high and unbridled were the dark bushes in front of it. He looked in through the gateway at the dark porch, slowly opened the gate, and went up the overgrown path. In the half-darkness, he could see the sagging, dilapidated porch and the shaky steps. The paint had long disappeared from the clapboard walls, and no work had ever been done on the garden. If it had not been for the vein of light around the edges of the drawn shades, he would have passed on, thinking the house deserted. The stair treads seemed to crumple under his weight, and the porch planks squealed as he crossed them. The front door opened, and he could see a dim figure holding the knob. A soft voice said, "'Won't you come in?' The reception room was dimly lighted by small globes set under ro rose-colored shades. Adam could feel a thick carpet under his feet. He could see the shine of polished furniture and the gleam of gold picture frames." He got a quick impression of richness and order. The soft voice said, You should have worn a raincoat. Do we know you? No, you don't, said Adam. Who sent you? A man at the hotel. Adam peered at the girl before him. She was dressed in black and wore no ornaments. Her face was sharp, pretty and sharp. He tried to think of what animal, what night prowler she reminded him of. It was some secret and predatory animal. The girl said, I'll move nearer to a lamp if you like. No. She laughed. Sit down, over here. You did come here for something, didn't you? If you'll tell me what you want, I'll call the proper girl. The low voice had a precise and husky power, and she picked her words as one picks flowers in a mixed garden and took her time choosing. She made Adam seem clumsy to himself. He blurted out, I want to see Kate. Miss Kate is busy now. Does she expect you? No. I can take care of you, you know. I want to see Kate. Can you tell me what you want to see her about? No. The girl's voice took on the edge of a blade sharpened on a stone. You can't see her. She's busy. If you don't want a girl or something else, you'd better go away. Well... Will you tell her I'm here? Does she know you? I don't know, he felt his courage going. This was a remembered cold. I don't know, but will you tell her that Adam Trask would like to see her? She'll know then whether I know her or not. I see. Well, I'll tell her. She moved silently to a door on the right and opened it. Adam heard a few muffled words and a man looked through the door. The girl left the door open so that Adam would know he was not alone. On one side of the room, heavy dark portieres hung over a doorway. The girl parted the deep folds and disappeared. Adam sat back in his chair. Out of the side of his eyes, he saw the man's head thrust in and then withdrawn. Kate's private room was comfort and efficiency. It did not look at all like the room where Faye had lived. The walls were clad in saffron silk and the drapes were apple green. It was a silken room, deep chairs with silk upholstered cushions, lamps with silken shades, a broad bed at the far end of the room with a gleaming white satin cover on which were piled gigantic pillows. 
There was no picture on the wall, no photograph or personal thing of any kind. A dressing table near the bed had no bottle or vial on its ebony top, and its sheen was reflected in triple mirrors. The rug was old and deep in Chinese, an apple green dragon on saffron. One end of the room was bedroom, the center was social, and the other end was office, filing cabinets of golden oak, a large safe, black with gold lettering, and a roll-top desk with a green hooded double lamp over it, a swivel chair behind it, and a straight chair beside it. Kate sat in the swivel chair behind the desk. She was still pretty. Her hair was blonde again. Her mouth was little and firm and turned up at the corners as always but her outlines were not sharp anywhere. Her shoulders had become plump while her hands grew lean and wrinkled. Her cheeks were chubby and the skin under her chin was crepe. Her breasts were still tiny, but a padding of fat protruded her stomach a little. Her hips were slender, but her legs and feet had thickened so that a bulge hung over her low shoes. And through her stockings, faintly, could be seen the wrappings of elastic bandage to support the veins. Still, she was pretty and neat. Only her hands had really aged, the palms and finger pads shining and tight, the backs wrinkled and splotched with brown. She was dressed severely in a dark dress with long sleeves, and only the contrast was billowing white lace at her wrist and throat. The work of the years had been subtle. If one had been nearby, it is probable that no ch change at all would have been noticed. Kate's cheeks were unlined, her eyes sharp and shallow, her nose delicate, and her lips thin and firm. The scar on her forehead was barely visible. It was covered with a powder tinted to match Kate's skin. Kate inspected a sheaf of photographs on her roll-top desk, all the same size, all taken by the same camera and bright with flash powder. And although the characters were different in each picture, there was a dreary similarity about their postures. The faces of the women were never toward the camera. Kate arranged the pictures in four piles and slipped each pile into a heavy manila envelope. When the knock came on her door, she put the envelopes in a pigeonhole of her desk. Come in. Oh, come in, Eva. Is he here? The girl came to the desk before she replied. In the increased light, her face showed tight and her eyes were shiny. It's a new one. A stranger. He says he wants to see you. Well, he can't, Eva. You know who's coming. I told him you couldn't see him. He said he thought he knew you. Well, who is he, Eva? He's a big gangly man, a little bit drunk. He says his name is Adam Trask. Although Kate made no movement or sound, Eva knew something had struck home. The fingers of Kate's right hand slowly curled around the palm while the left hand crept like a lean cat toward the edge of the desk. Kate sat still as though she held her breath. Eva was jittery. Her mind went to the box in her dresser drawer where her hypodermic needle lay. Kate said at last, Sit over there in that big chair, Eva. Just sit still a minute. When the girl did not move, Kate whipped one word at her. Sit! Eva cringed and went to the big chair. Don't pick your nails, said Kate. Eva's hands separated, and each one clung to an arm of the chair. Kate stared straight ahead at the green glass shades of her desk lamp. Then she moved so suddenly that Eva jumped and her lips quivered. Kate opened the desk drawer and took out a folded paper. Here, go to your room and fix yourself up. Don't take it all. No, I won't trust you. Kate tapped the powder and tore it in two. A little white powder spilled before she folded the ends and passed one to Eva. Now hurry up. When you come downstairs, tell Ralph... I want him in the hall close enough to hear the bell, but not the voices. Watch him to see he doesn't creep up. If he hears the bell, no, tell him. No, let him do it his own way. After that, bring Mr. Adam Trask to me. Will you be all right, Miss Kate? Kate looked at her until she turned away. Kate called after her. You can have the other half as soon as he goes. Now hurry up. After the door had closed, Kate opened the right-hand drawer of her desk and took out a revolver with a short barrel. She swung the cylinder sideways and looked at the cartridges, snapped it shut and put on her desk, and laid a sheet of paper over it. She turned off one of the lights and settled back in her chair. She clasped her hands on the desk in front of her. 
When the knock came on the door, she called, Come in, hardly moving her lips. Eva's eyes were wet and she was relaxed. Here he is, she said, and closed the door behind Adam. He glanced quickly about before he saw Kate sitting so quietly behind the desk. He stared at her, and then he moved slowly toward her. Her hands unclasped and her right hand moved toward the paper. Her eyes, cold and expressionless, remained on his eyes. Adam saw her hair, her scar, her lips, her craping throat, her arms and shoulders and flat breast. He sighed deeply. Kate's hand shook a little. She said, what do you want? Adam sat in the straight chair beside the desk. He wanted to shout with relief, but he said, nothing now. I just wanted to see you. Sam Hamilton told me you were here. The moment he sat down, the shake went out of her hand. Hadn't you heard before? No, he said. I hadn't heard. It made me a little crazy at first, but now I'm all right. Kate relaxed and her mouth smiled and her little teeth showed, the long canine sharp and white. She said, you frightened me. Why? Well, I didn't know what you'd do. Neither did I, said Adam, and he continued to stare at her as though she were not alive. I expected you for a long time, and when you didn't come, I guess I forgot you. I didn't forget you, he said, but now I can. What do you mean? He laughed pleasantly. Now I see you, I mean. You know, I guess it was Samuel said I'd never seen you, and it's true. I remember your face, but I had never seen it. Now I can forget it. Her lips closed and straightened and her wide set eyes narrowed with cruelty. You think you can? I know I can. She changed her manner. Maybe you won't have to, she said. If you feel all right about everything, maybe we could get together. <laughs> I don't think so, said Adam. You are such a fool, she said, like a child. You didn't know what things to do with yourself. I can teach you now. You seem to be a man. You have taught me, he said. It was a pretty sharp lesson. Would you like a drink? Yes, he said. I can smell your breath. You've been drinking rum. She got up and went to a cabinet for a bottle and two glasses, and when she turned back, she noticed that he was looking at her fattened ankles. Her quick rage did not change the little smile on her lips. She carried the bottle to the round table in the middle of the room and filled the two small glasses with rum. Come, sit over here, she said. It's more comfortable. As he moved to a big chair, she saw that his eyes were on her protruding stomach. She handed him a glass, sat down, and folded her hands across her middle. He sat holding his glass, and she said, Drink it. It's very good rum. He smiled at her, a smile she had never seen. She said, When Eva told me you were here, I thought at first I would have to, th have, to have you thrown out. I would have come back, he said. I had to see you. Not that I mistrusted Samuel, but just to prove it to myself. Drink your rum she said. He glanced at her glass. You don't think I'd poison you? She stopped and was angry that she had said it. Smiling, he still gazed at her glass. Her anger came through to her face. She picked up her glass and touched her lips to it. Liquor makes me sick, she said. I never drink it. It poisons me. She shut her mouth tight and her sharp teeth bit down on her lower lip. Adam continued to smile at her. Her rage was rising beyond her control. She tossed the rum down her throat and coughed, and her eyes watered and she wiped her tears away with the back of her hand. You don't trust me very much, she said. No, I don't. He raised his glass and drank his rum, then got up and filled both glasses. I will not drink any more, she said in a panic. You don't have to, Adam said. I'll just finish this and go along. The biting alcohol burned in her throat and she felt the stirring in her that frightened her. I'm not afraid of you or anyone else, she said, and she drank off her second glass. You haven't any reason to be afraid of me, said Adam. You can forget me now, but you said that you had already. He felt gloriously warm and safe, better than he had for many years. 
I came up to Sam Hamilton's funeral, he said. That was a fine man. I'll miss him. Do you remember Kathy? He helped you with the twins. In Kate, the liquor raged. She fought and the strain of the fight showed on her face. What's the matter? Adam asked. I told you it poisoned me. I told you it makes me sick. I couldn't take the chance, he calmly said. You shot me once. I don't know well what else you've done. What do you mean? Oh, I've heard about some scandal, he said. Just dirty scandal. For the moment, she had forgotten her will fight against the cruising alcohol, and now she had lost the battle. The redness was up in her brain, and her fear was gone, and in its place was cruelty without caution. She snatched the bottle and filled her glass. Adam had to get up to pour his own. A feeling completely foreign to him had arisen. He was enjoying what he saw in her. He liked to see her struggling. He felt good about punishing her, but he was also watchful. Now I must be careful, he told himself. Don't talk. Don't talk. He said aloud, Sam Hamilton has been a good friend to me all these years. I'll miss him. She had spilled some rum, and it moistened the corners of her mouth. I hated him, she said. I would have killed him if I could. Why? He was kind to us. He looked, he looked into me. Why not? He looked into me too, and he helped me. I hate him, she said. I'm glad he's dead. Might have been good if I had looked into you, Adam said. Her lip curled. You are a fool, she said. I don't hate you. You're just a weak fool. As her tension built up, a warm calm settled on Adam. Sit there and grin, she cried. You think you're free, don't you? A few drinks and you think you're a man. I could crook my little finger and you'd come back slobbering, crawling on your knees. Her sense of power was loose and her vixen carefulness abandoned. I know you, she said. I know your cowardly heart. Adam went on smiling. He tasted his drink and that reminded her to pour herself another. The bottleneck chattered against her glass. When I was hurt, I needed you, she said, but you were slop, and when I didn't need you anymore, you tried to stop me. Take that ugly smirk off your face. I wonder what it is you hate so much. You wonder, do you? Her caution was almost entirely gone. It isn't hatred, it's contempt. When I was a little girl, I knew what stupid lying fools they were. My own mother and father pretending goodness, and they weren't good. I knew them. I could make them do whatever I wanted. I could always make people do what I wanted. When I was half grown, I made a man kill himself. He pretended to be good too, and all he wanted was to go to bed with me, a little girl. But you say he killed himself. He must have been very sorry about something. He was a fool, said Kate. I heard him come to the door and beg. I laughed all night. Adam said, I wouldn't like to think I'd driven anybody out of the world. You're a fool, too. I remember how they talked. Isn't she a pretty little thing? So sweet, so dainty. And no one knew me. I made them jump through hoops, and they never knew it. Adam drained his glass. He felt remote and inspective. He thought he could see her impulses crawling like ants and could read them. The sense of deep understanding that alcohol sometimes gives was on him. He said... It doesn't matter whether you like Sam Hamilton. I found him wise. I remember he said one time that a woman who knows all about men usually knows one part very well and can't conceive the other parts, but that doesn't mean they aren't there. He was a liar and a hypocrite too, Kate spat out her words. That's what I, what I hate, the liars, and they're all liars. That's what it is. I love to show them up. I love to rub their noses in their own nastiness. Adam's brows went up. Do you mean that in the whole world, there's only evil and folly? That's exactly what I mean. I don't believe it, Adam said quietly. You don't believe it? You don't believe it? She mimicked him. Would you like me to prove it? You can't, he said. She jumped up, ran to her desk, and brought the brown envelopes to the table. Take a look at those, she said. I don't want to. I'll show you anyway. She took out a photograph. Look there. That's a state senator. He thinks he's going to run for Congress. Look at his fat stomach. He's got boobs like a woman. 
He likes whips. That streak there, that's a whip mark. Look at that expression on his face. He's got a wife and four kids and he's going to run for Congress. You don't believe? Look at this. This piece of white blubber is a councilman. This big red Swede has a ranch out near Blanco. Look here. This is a professor at Berkeley. Comes all the way down here to have his, the toilet splashed in his face. Professor of philosophy. And look at this. This is a minister of the gospel, a little brother of Jesus. He used to burn a house down to get what he wanted. We give it to him now another way. See that lighted match under his skinny flank? I don't want to see these, said Adam. Well, you have seen them, and you don't believe it. I'll have you begging to get in here. I'll have you screaming at the moon. She tried to force her will on him, and she saw that he was detached and free. Her rage congealed to poison. No one has ever escaped, she said softly. Her eyes were flat and cold, but her fingernails were tearing at the upholstery of the chair, ripping and fraying the silk. Adam sighed. If I had those pictures and those men knew it, I wouldn't think my life was very safe, he said. I guess one of those pictures could destroy a man's whole life. Aren't you in danger? Do you think I'm a child? She asked. Not anymore, said Adam. I'm beginning to think you're a twisted human, or no human at all. She smiled. Maybe you've struck it, she said. Do you think I want to be human? Look at those pictures. I'd rather be a dog than a human, but I'm not a dog. I'm smarter than humans. Nobody can hurt me. Don't worry about danger. She waved at the filing cabinets. I have a hundred beautiful pictures in there, and those men know that if anything should happen to me, anything, one hundred letters, each one with a picture, would be dropped in the mail, and each letter will go where it will do the most harm. No, they won't hurt me. Adam asked, but suppose you had an accident, or maybe a disease. That wouldn't make any difference, she said. She leaned closer to him. I'm going to tell you a secret none of those men knows. In a few years, I'll be going away. And when I do, those envelopes will be dropped in the mail anyway. She leaned back in her chair, laughing. Adam shivered. He looked closely at her. Her face and her laughter were childlike and innocent. He got up and poured himself another drink, a short drink. The bottle was nearly empty. I know what you hate. You hate something in them you can't understand. You don't hate their evil. You hate the good in them you can't get at. I wonder what you want. What final thing? I'll have all the money I need, she said. I'll go to New York and I won't be old. I'm not old. I'll buy a house, a nice house in a nice neighborhood, and I'll have nice servants. And first I will find a man. If he's still alive and very slowly and with the greatest attention to pain, I will take his life away. If I do it well and carefully, he will go crazy before he dies. Adam stamped on the floor impatiently. Nonsense, he said. This isn't true. This is crazy. None of this is true. I don't believe any of it. She said, do you remember when you first saw me? His face darkened. Oh, Lord, yes. You remember my broken jaw, my split lips, and my missing teeth? I remember. I don't want to remember. My pleasure will be to find the man who did that, she said. And after that... There will be other pleasures. I have to go, Adam said. She said, don't go, dear. Don't go now, my love. My sheets are silk. I want you to feel those sheets against your skin. You don't mean that. Oh, I do, my love, I do. You aren't clever at love, but I can teach you. I will teach you. She stood up unsteadily and laid her hand on his arm. Her face seemed fresh and young. Adam looked down at her hand and saw it wrinkled as a pale monkey's paw. He moved away in revulsion. She saw his gesture and understood it, and her mouth hardened. I don't understand, he said. I know, but I can't believe. I know I won't believe it in the morning. It will be a nightmare dream. But no, it, it can't be a dream. No, because I remember you are the mother of my boys. You haven't asked about them. You are the mother of my sons. Kate put her elbows on her knees and cupped her hands under her chin so that her fingers covered her pointed ears. Her eyes were bright with triumph. Her voice was mockingly soft. A fool always leaves an opening, she said. 
I discovered that when I was a child. I am the mother of your sons. Your sons? I am the mother, yes. But how do you know you are the father? Adam's mouth dropped open. Kathy, what do you mean? My name is Kate, she said. Listen, my darling, and remember, how many times did I let you come near enough to me to have children? You were hurt, he said. You were terribly hurt. Once, said Kate. Just once. The pregnancy made you ill, he protested. It was hard on you. She smiled at him sweetly. I wasn't too hurt for your brother. My brother? Have you forgotten Charles? Adam laughed. You are a devil, he said. But do you think I could believe that of my brother? I don't care what you believe, she said. Adam said, I don't believe it. You will. At first you will wonder, and then you'll be unsure. You'll think back about Charles, all about him. I could have loved Charles. He was like me in a way. He was not. You'll remember, she said. Maybe one day you will remember some tea that tasted bitter. You took my medicine by mistake. Remember? Slept as you had never slept before and awakened late. Thick-headed? You were too hurt to plan a thing like that. I can do anything, she said. And now, my love, take off your clothes, and I will show you what else I can do. Adam closed his eyes, and his head reeled with the rum. He opened his eyes and shook his head violently. It wouldn't matter, even if it were true, he said. It wouldn't matter at all. And suddenly he laughed, because he knew that this was so. He stood too quickly and had to grab the back of his chair to steady himself against dizziness. Kate leaped up and put both of her hands on his elbow. Let me help you take your coat off. Adam twisted her hands from his arm as though they were wire. He moved unsteadily toward the door. Uncontrolled hatred shone in Kate's eyes. She screamed, a long and shrill animal screech. Adam stopped and turned toward her. The door banged open. The house pimp took three steps, poised, pivoted with his whole weight, and his fist struck Adam under the ear. Adam crashed to the floor. Kate screamed, the boots! Give him the boots! Ralph moved closer to the fallen man and measured the distance. He noticed Adam's eyes open, staring up at him. He turned nervously to Kate. Her voice was cold. I said give him the boots. Break his face. Ralph said he ain't fighting back. The fight's all out of him. Kate sat down. She breathed through her mouth. Her hands writhed in her lap. Adam, she said. I hate you. I hate you now for the first time. I hate you. Adam, are you listening? I hate you. Adam tried to sit up, fell back, and tried again. Sitting on the floor, he looked up at Kate. It doesn't matter, he said. It doesn't matter at all. He got to his knees and rested with his knuckles against the floor. He said, do you know, I loved you better than anything in the world. I did. It was so strong that it took quite a killing. You'll come crawling back, she said. You'll drag your belly on the floor, begging, begging. You want the boots now, Miss Kate? Ralph asked. She did not answer. Adam moved very slowly toward the door, balancing his steps carefully. His hand fumbled at the door jam. Kate called, Adam! He turned slowly. He smiled at her as a man might smile at a memory. Then he went out and closed the door gently behind him. Cat, Kate sat staring at the door. Her eyes were desolate. Chapter 26 On the train back to King City from his trip to Salinas, Adam Trask was in a cloud of vague forms and sounds and colors. He was not conscious of any thought at all. I believe there are techniques of the human mind whereby, in its dark deep, problems are examined, rejected, or accepted. Such activities sometimes concern facets a man does not know he has. How often one goes to sleep troubled and full of pain, not knowing what causes the travail, and in the morning a whole new direction and a clearness is there may be the result of the black reasoning. And again, there are mornings when ecstasy bubbles in the blood and the stomach and chest are tight and electric with joy and nothing in the thoughts to justify it or cause it. Samuel's funeral and the talk with Kate should have made Adam sad and bitter, but they did not. 
Out of the gray throbbing and ecstasy arose. He felt young and free and filled with a hungry gaiety. He got up off the train in King City, and instead of going directly to the livery stable to claim his horse and buggy, he walked to Will Hamilton's new garage. Will was sitting in his glass-walled office from which he could watch the activity of his mechanics without hearing the clamor of their work. Will's stomach was beginning to fill out richly. He was studying an advertisement for cigars shipped direct and often from Cuba. He thought he was mourning for his dead father, but he was not. He did have some little worry about Tom, who had gone directly from the funeral to San Francisco. He felt that it was more dignified to lose oneself in business, as he intended to do, than in alcohol, as Tom was probably doing. He looked up when Adam came into the office and waved his hand to one of the big leather chairs he had installed to lull his customers past the size of the bills they were going to have to pay. Adam sat down. I don't know whether I offered my condolences, he said. It's a sad time, said Will. You were at the funeral? Yes, said Adam. I don't know whether you know how I felt about your father. He gave me things I will never forget. He was respected, said Will. There were over 200 people at the cemetery. Over 200. Such a man doesn't really die, Adam said, and he was discovering it himself. I can't think of him, Dad. He seems maybe more alive to me than before. That's true, said Will, and it was not true to him. To Will, Samuel was dead. I think of things he said, Adam went on. When he said them, I didn't listen very closely, but now they come back, and I can see his face when he said them. That's true, said Will. I was just thinking the same thing. Are you going back to your place? Yes, I am, but I thought I would come in and talk to you about buying an automobile. A subtle change came over Will a kind of silent alertness. I would have said you'd be the last man in the valley to get a car. He observed and watched through half-closed eyes for Adam's reaction. Adam laughed. I guess I deserve that, he said. Maybe your father is responsible for a change in me. How do you mean? I don't know as I could explain it. Anyway, let's talk about a car. I'll give you the straight dope on it, said Will. The truth of, ma of the matter is that I'm having one hell of a time getting enough cars to fill my orders. Why, I've got a list of people who want them. Is that so? Well, maybe I'll just have to put my name on the list. I'd be glad to do that, Mr. Trask, and, he paused, I've been so close to the family that, well, if there should be a cancellation, I'd be glad to move you up on that list. That's kind of you, said Adam. How would you like to arrange it? How do you mean? Well, I can arrange it so you pay only so much a month. Isn't it more expensive that way? Well, there's interest in a carrying charge. Some people find it convenient. I think I'll pay cash, said Adam. There'd be no point in putting it off. Will chuckled. Not very many people feel that way, he said. And there's going to come a time when I won't be able to sell for cash without losing money. I'd never thought of that, said Adam. You will put me on the list, though. Will leaned toward him. Mr. Trask, I'm going to put you on the top of the list. The first car that comes in, you're going to have. Thank you. I'll be glad to do it for you, said Will. Adam asked, how is your mother holding up? Will leaned back in his chair and an affectionate smile came on his face. She's a remarkable woman, he said. She's like a rock. I think back on all the hard times we had, and we had plenty of them. My father wasn't very practical. He was always off in the clouds or buried in a book. I think my mother held us together and kept the Hamiltons out of the poorhouse. She's a fine woman, Adam said. Not only fine, she's strong. She stands on her two feet. She's a tower of strength. Did you come back to Olive's house after the funeral? No, I didn't. Well, over a hundred people did, and my mother fried all that chicken and saw that everybody had enough. She didn't. Yes, yeah, she did. And when you think, it was her own husband. A remarkable woman, Adam repeated Will's phrase. She's practical. She knew they had to be fed, and she fed them. I guess she'll be all right, but it must be a great loss to her. She'll be all right, Will said, and she'll outlive us all, little tiny thing that she is. On his drive back to the ranch, Adam found that he was noticing things he had not seen for years. 
He saw the wild flowers and the heavy grass, and he saw the red cows against the hillsides, moving up the easy ascending paths and eating as they went. When he came to his own land, Adam felt a quick pleasure so sharp that he began to examine it. And suddenly, he found himself saying aloud in rhythm with his horse's trotting feet, I'm free, I'm free. I don't have to worry anymore. I'm free. She's gone. She's out of me. Oh, Christ Almighty, I'm free. He reached out and stripped the fur from the silver gray sage beside the road, and when his fingers were sticky with the sap, he smelled the sharp, penetrating odors on his fingers, breathed deep into his lungs. He was glad to be going home. He wanted to see how the twins had grown in the two days he had been gone. He wanted to see the twins. I'm free. She's gone, he chanted aloud. Lee came out of the house to meet Adam, and he stood at the horse's head while Adam climbed down from the buggy. How are the boys? Adam asked. They're fine. I made them some bows and arrows, and they went hunting rabbits in the river bottom. I'm not keeping the pan hot, though. Everything all right here? Lee looked at him sharply, was about to exclaim, changed his mind. How was the funeral? Lots of people, Adam said. He had lots of friends. I can't get it through my head that he's gone. My people bury them with drums and scatter papers to confuse the devils and put roast pigs instead of flowers on the grave. We're a practical people and always a little hungry, but our devils aren't very bright. We can outthink them. That's some progress. I think Samuel would have liked that kind of funeral, said Adam. It would have interested him. He noticed that Lee was staring at him. Put the horse away, Lee, and then come in and make some tea. I want to talk to you. Adam went into the house and took off his black clothes. He could smell the sweet and now sickish odor of rum about himself. He removed all of his clothes and sponged his skin with yellow soap until the odor was gone from his pores. He put on a clean blue shirt and overalls washed until they were soft and pale blue and lighter blue at the knees where the wear came. He shaved slowly and combed his hair while the rattle of Lee at the stove sounded from the kitchen. Then he went to the living room. Lee had set out one cup and a bowl of sugar on the table beside his big chair. Adam looked around at the flowered curtains washed so long that the blossoms were pale. He saw the worn rugs on the floor and the brown path on the linoleum in the hall, and it was all new to him. When Lee came in with a teapot, Adam said, Bring yourself a cup, Lee, and if you've got any of that drink of yours, I could use a little. I got drunk last night. Lee said, You drunk? I can hardly believe it. Well, I was, and I want to talk about it. I saw you looking at me. Did you? asked Lee, and he went to the kitchen to bring his cup and glasses and his stone bottle of Nicappi. He said when he came back, The only times I've tasted it for years have been with you and Mr. Hamilton. Is that the same one we named the twins with? Yes, it is. Lee poured the scalding green tea. He grimaced when Adam put two spoonfuls of sugar in his cup. Adam stirred his tea and watched the sugar crystals whirl and disappear into liquid. He said, I went down to see her. I thought you might, said Lee. As a matter of fact, I don't see how a human man could have waited so long. Maybe I wasn't a human man. I thought of that too. How was she? Adam said slowly, I can't understand it. I can't believe there is such a creature in the world. The trouble with you accidentals is that you don't have devils to explain things with. Did you get drunk afterward? No, before and during. I needed it for courage, I guess. You look all right now. I am all right, said Adam. That's what I want to talk to you about. He paused and said ruefully, This time last year I would have run to Sam Hamilton to talk. Maybe both of us have got a piece of him, said Lee. Maybe that's what immortality is. I seem to come out of a sleep, said Adam. In some strange way, my eyes have cleared. A weight is off me. You even use words that sound like Mr. Hamilton, said Lee. I'll build a theory for my immortal relatives. Adam drank his cup of black liquor and licked his lips. I'm free, he said. I have to tell it to someone. I can live with my boys. I might even see a woman. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, I know, and I can see it in your eyes and in the way your body stands. A man can't lie about a thing like that. You'll like the boys, I think. Well, at least I'm going to give myself a chance. Will you give me another drink and some more tea? Lee poured the tea and picked up his cup. 
I don't know why you don't scald your mouth drinking it that hot. Lee was smiling inwardly. Adam, looking at him, realized that Lee was not a young man anymore. The skin on his cheeks was stretched tight, and its surface shone as though it were glazed, and there was a red, irritated rim around his eyes. Lee studied the shell-thin cup in his hand, and his was a memory smile. Maybe if you're free, you can free me. What do you mean, Lee? Could you let me go? Why, of course you can go. Aren't you happy here? I don't think I've ever known what you people call happiness. We think of contentment as a desirable thing, and maybe that's negative. Adam said, Call it that, then. Aren't you contented here? Lee said, I don't think any man is contented when there are things undone he wishes to do. What do you wish for? Well, one thing it's too late for. I wanted to have a wife and sons of my own. Maybe I wanted to hand down the nonsense that passes for wisdom in a parent to force it on my own helpless children. You're not too old. Oh, I guess I'm physically able to father a child. That's not what I'm thinking. I'm too closely married to a quiet reading lamp. You know, Mr. Trask, once I had a wife. I made her up just as you did. Only mine had no life outside my mind. She was good company in my little room. I would talk and she would listen, and then she would talk, would tell me all the happenings of a woman's afternoon. She was very pretty and she made coquettish little jokes. But now I don't know whether I would listen to her, and I wouldn't want to make her sad or lonely. So there's my first plan gone. What was the other? I talked to Mr. Hamilton about that. I want to open a bookstore in Chinatown in San Francisco. I would live in the back and my days would be full of discussions and arguments. I would like to have in stock some of those dragon-carved blocks of ink from the dynasty of Sung. The boxes are warm, are worm board, and that ink is made from fur smoke and a glue that comes only from wild ass's skin. When you paint with that ink, it may physically be black, but it suggests to your eye and persuades your seeing that it is all colors in the world. Maybe a painter would come by and we could argue about method and haggle about price. Adam said, Are you making this up? No. If you are well and if you are free, I would like to have my little bookshop at last. I would like to die there. Adam sat silently for a while, stirring sugar into his lukewarm tea. Then he said, Funny. I found myself wishing you were a slave so I could refuse you. Of course you can go if you want to. I'll even lend you the money for your bookstore. Oh, I have the money. I've had it a long time. I never thought of your going, Adam said. I took you for granted. He straightened his shoulders. Could you wait a little while? What for? I want you to help me get acquainted with my boys. I want to put this place in shape or maybe sell it or rent it. I want to know how much money I have left and what I can do with it. You wouldn't lay a trap for me, Lee asked. My wish isn't as strong as it once was. I'm afraid I could be talked out of it, or what would be worse, I could be held back just by being needed. Please try not to need me. That's the worst bait of all to a lonely man. Adam said, A lonely man. I must have been far down in myself not to have thought of that. Mr. Hamilton knew, said Lee. He raised his head and his fat lids let only two sparks from his eyes show through. We're controlled, we Chinese, he said. We show no emotion. I loved Mr. Hamilton. I would like to go to Salinas tomorrow, if you will permit it. Do anything you want, said Adam. God knows you've done enough for me. I want to scatter devil papers, Lee said. I want to put a little roast pig on the grave of my father. Adam got up quickly and knocked over his cup and went outside and left Lee sitting there. Chapter 27 that year the rains had come so gently that the Salinas River did not overflow. A slender stream twisted back and forth in its broad bend of gray sand, and the water was not milky with silt, but clear and pleasant. The willows that grow in the riverbed were well-leafed, and the wild blackberry vines were thrusting their spiky new shoots along the ground. It was very warm for March, and the kite wind blew steadily from the south and turned up the silver undersides of the leaves. Against the perfect cover of vine and bramble and tangled drift sticks, a little gray brush rabbit sat quietly in the sun, drying his breast fur wet by the grass dew of his early feeding. 
The rabbit's nose crinkled and his ears slewed about now and then, investigating small sounds that might possibly be charged with danger to a brush rabbit. There had been a rhythmic vibration in the ground audible through the paws, so that the ears swung and nose wrinkled, but that had stopped. Then there had been a movement of willow branches 25 yards away and downward, so that no odor of fear came to the rabbit. For the last two minutes there had been sounds of interest, but not of danger. A snap and then a whistle like that of the wings of a wild dove. The rabbit stretched out one hind leg lazily in the warm sun. There was a snap and a whistle and a grunting thud on fur. The rabbit sat perfectly still and his eyes grew large. A bamboo arrow was through his chest and its iron tip deep in the ground on the other side. The rabbit slumped over on his side and his feet ran and scampered in the air for a moment before he was still. From the willow, two crouching boys crept. They carried four-foot bows and tufts of arrows stuck their feathers up from the quivers behind their left shoulders. They were dressed in overalls and faded blue shirts, but each boy wore one perfect turkey tail feather tied with tape against his temple. The boys moved cautiously, bending low, self-consciously towing in like Indians. The rabbit's flutter of death was finished when they bent over to examine their victim. Right through the heart, said Cal, as though it could not be any other way. Aaron looked down and said nothing. I'm going to say you did it, Kel went on. I won't take credit, and I'll say it was a hard shot. Well, it was, said Aaron. Well, I'm telling you, I'll give you credit to Lee and the father. I don't know as I want credit. Not all of it, said Aaron. Tell you what, if we get another one, we'll say we each hit one, and if we don't get any more, why don't we say we both shot together and we don't know who hit? Don't you want full credit? Cal asked suddenly. Well, not full credit. We could divide it up. After all, it was my arrow, said Cal. No, it wasn't. You look at the feathers. See that nick? That's mine. How did it get in my quiver? I don't remember any nick. Maybe you don't remember, but I'm going to give you credit anyway. Aaron said gratefully. No, Cal, I don't want that. We'll say we both shot at once. Well, if that's what you want, but suppose Lee, suppose Lee sees it was my arrow. We'll just say it was in my quiver. You think he'll believe that? He'll think you're lying. Aaron said helplessly. If he thinks you shot it, why, we'll just let him think that. I just wanted you to know, said Cal, just in case he'd think that. He drew the arrow through the rabbit so that the white feathers were dark red with heart blood. He put the arrow in his quiver. You can carry him, he said magnanimously. We ought to start back, said Aaron. Maybe father is back by now. Cal said we could cook that old rabbit and have him for our supper and stay out all night. It's too cold at night, Cal. Don't you remember how you shivered this morning? It's not too cold for me, said Cal. I never feel cold. You did this morning. No, I didn't. I was just making fun of you, shivering and chattering like a milk baby. Do you want to call me a liar? No, said Aaron. I don't want to fight. Afraid to fight? No, I just don't want to. If I was to say you were scared, would you want to call me a liar? No. Then you're scared, aren't you? I guess so. Aaron wandered slowly away, leaving the rabbit on the ground. His eyes were very wide and he had a beautiful soft mouth. The width between his blue eyes gave him an expression of angelic innocence. His hair was fine and golden. The sun seemed to light up the top of his head. He was puzzled, but he was often puzzled. He knew his brother was getting at something, but he didn't know what. Cal was an enigma to him. He could not follow the reasoning of his brother, and he was always surprised at the tangents it took. Cal looked more like Adam. His hair was dark brown. He was bigger than his brother, bigger of bone, heavier in the shoulder, and his jaw had the square sternness of Adam's jaw. Cal's eyes were brown and watchful, and sometimes they sparkled as though they were black. But Cal's hands were very small for the size of the rest of him. The fingers were short and slender, the nails delicate. Cal protected his hands. There were few things that could make him cry, but a cut finger was one of them. He never ventured with his hands, never touched an insect or carried a snake about. And in a fight, he picked up a rock or a stick to fight with. As Cal watched his brother walking away from him, there was a small, sure smile on his lips. He called, Aaron, 
Wait for me. When he caught up with his brother, he held out the rabbit. You can carry it, he said kindly, putting his arm around his brother's shoulders. Don't be mad with me. You always want to fight, said Aaron. No, I don't. I was only making a joke. Were you? Sure, look, you can carry the rabbit and we'll start back now if you want. Aaron smiled at last. He was always relieved when his brother let the tension go. The two boys trudged up out of the river bottom and up the crumbling cliff to the level land. Aaron's right trouser leg was well bloodied from the rabbit. Cal said, They'd be surprised we got a rabbit. If father's home, let's give it to him. He likes a rabbit for his supper. All right, Aaron said happily. Tell you what, we'll both give it to him and we won't say which one hit it. All right, if you want to, said Cal. They walked along in silence for a time and then Cal said, All this is our land, way to hell over the river. It's father's. Yes, but when he dies, it's going to be ours. This was a new thought to Aaron. What do you mean when he dies? Everybody dies, said Cal, like Mr. Hamilton, he died. Oh, yes, Aaron said, yes, he died. He couldn't connect the two, the dead Mr. Hamilton and the live father. They put him in a box and then they dig a hole and put the box in, said Cal. I know that. Aaron wanted to change the subject to think of something else. Cal said, I know a secret. What is it? You'd tell. No, I wouldn't if you said not. I don't know if I ought. Tell me, Aaron begged. You won't tell? No, I won't. Cal said, where do you think our mother is? She's dead. No, she isn't. She is too. She ran away, said Cal. I heard some men talking. They were liars. She ran away, said Cal. You won't tell I told you. I don't believe it, said Aaron. Father said she was in heaven. Cal said quietly, pretty soon I'm going to run away and find her. I'll bring her back. Where do the men say she is? I don't know, but I'll find her. She's in heaven, said Aaron. Why would father tell a lie? He looked at his brother, begging him silently to agree. Cal didn't answer him. Don't you think she's in heaven with the angels? Aaron insisted. And when Cal still didn't answer, Who were the men who said it? Just some men in the post office at King City. They didn't think I could hear, but I got good ears. Lee says I can hear the grass grow. Aaron said, what would she want to run away for? How do I know? Maybe she didn't like us. Aaron inspected this heresy. No, he said. The men were liars. Father said she's in heaven, and you know how he don't like to talk about her. Maybe that's because she ran away. No, I asked Lee. Know what Lee said? Lee said, your mother loved you and she still does. And Lee gave me a star to look at. He said maybe that was our mother and she would love us as long as the light was there. Do you think Lee is a liar? Through his gathering tears, Aaron could see his brother's eyes hard and reasonable. There were no tears in Cal's eyes. Cal felt pleasantly excited. He had found another implement, another secret tool, to use for any purpose he needed. He studied Aaron, saw his quivering lips, but he noticed in time the flaring nostrils. Aaron would cry, but sometimes push the tears. Aaron would fight, too. And when Aaron cried and fought at the same time, he was dangerous. Nothing could hurt him and nothing could stop him. Once Lee had held him in his lap, clasping his still flailing, flailing fist to his sides, until after a long time he relaxed, and his nostrils had flared then. Cal put his new tool away. He could bring it out any time, and he knew it was the sharpest weapon he had found. He would inspect it at his ease and judge just when and how much to use it. He made his decision almost too late. Aaron leaped at him and the limp body of the rabbit slashed against his face. Cal jumped back and cried. I was just joking. Honest, Aaron, it was only a joke. Aaron stopped. Pain and puzzlement were on his face. I don't like that joke, he said, and he sniffed and wiped his nose on his sleeve. Kel came close to him and hugged him and kissed him on the cheek. I won't do it anymore, he said. The boys trudged along silently for a while. The light of day began to withdraw. Kel looked over his shoulder at a thunderhead sailing blackly over the mountains on the nervous March wind. 
Going to storm, he said. Going to be a bastard, Aaron said. Did you really hear those men? Maybe I only thought I did, Cal said quickly. Jesus, look at that cloud. Aaron turned around to look at the black monster. It ballooned in great dark rolls above, and beneath it drew a long trailing skirt of rain. And as they looked, the cloud rumbled and flashed fire. Born on the wind, the cloudburst drummed hollowly on the fat, wet hills across the valley and moved out over the flat lands. The boys turned and ran for home, and the cloud boomed at their backs, and the lightning shattered the air into quaking pieces. The cloud caught up with them, and the first stout drops plopped on the ground out of the riven sky. They could smell the sweet odor of ozone. Running, they sniffed the thunder smell. As they raced across the country road and onto the wheel tracks that led to their own home, draw the water struck them. The rain fell in sheets and in columns. Instantly they were soaked through, and their hair plastered down on their foreheads and streamed into their eyes, and the turkey feathers at their temples bent over with the weight of water. Now that they were as wet as they could get, the boys stopped running. There was no reason to run for cover. They looked at each other and laughed for joy. Aaron wrung out the rabbit and tossed it in the air and caught it and threw it to Cal. And Cal, feeling silly, put it around his neck with head and hind feet under his chin. Both boys leaned over and laughed hysterically. The rain roared on the oak trees in the home draw, and the wind disturbed their high dignity. The twins came inside of the ranch buildings in time to see Lee, his head through the center hole of a yellow oilskin poncho, leading a strange horse in a flimsy rubber-tired buggy toward the shed. "'Somebody's here,' said Cal. "'Will you look at that rig?' They began to run again, for there was a certain deliciousness about visitors. Near the steps, they slowed down, moved cautiously around the house, for there was a certain fearsomeness about visitors, too." They went in the back way and stood dripping in the kitchen. They heard voices in the living room. Their father's voice and another, a man's voice, and then a third voice stiffened their stomachs and a rippled a little chill up their spines. It was a woman's voice. These boys had had very little experience with women. They tiptoed into their own room and stood looking at each other. Who do you suppose it is? Cal asked. An emotion like a light had burst in Aaron. He wanted to shout, Maybe it's our mother. Maybe she's come back. And then he remembered that she was in heaven and people do not come back from there. He said, I don't know. I'm going to put on dry clothes. The boys put on dry, clean clothes, which were exact replicas of the sopping clothes they were taking off. They took off the wet turkey feathers and combed their hair back with their fingers. And all the while they could hear the voices, mostly low pitched, and then the high woman's voice, and once they froze, listening, for they heard a child's voice, a girl's voice, and this was such an excitement that they did not even speak of hearing it. Silently, they edged into the hall and crept toward the door to the living room. Kel turned the doorknobs very, very slowly and lifted it up so that no creak would betray them. Only the smallest crack was open when Lee came in the back door, shuffled along the hall, getting out of his poncho, and caught them there. Lily boy peek, he said in pigeon, and when Cal closed the door and the latch clicked, Lee said quickly, your father's home, you'd better go in. Aaron whispered hoarsely, who else is there? Just some people going by, the rain drove them in. Lee put his hand over Cal's on the doorknob and turned it and opened the door. Boys, come long home, he said, and then left them there exposed in the opening. Adam cried, come in boys, come on in. The two carried their heads low and darted glances at the strangers and shuffled their feet. There was a man in city clothes and a woman in the fanciest clothes ever. Her duster and hat and veil lay on a chair beside her, and she seemed to the boys to be clad entirely in black silk and lace. Black lace even climbed up little sticks and hugged her throat. That was enough for one day, but it wasn't at all. Besides the woman sat a girl, a little younger maybe than the twins, but not much. She wore a blue check sunbonnet with lace around the front. Her dress was flowery and a little apron with pockets was tied around her middle. Her skirt was turned back, showing a petticoat of red knitted yarn with tatting around the edge. The boys could not see her face because of the sunbonnet, but her hands were folded in her lap and it was easy to see the little gold seal ring she wore on her third finger. 
Neither boy had drawn a breath, and the red wings were beginning to flare in back of their eyes from holding their breath. These are my boys, their father said. They're twins. That's Aaron, and this is Caleb. Boys, shake hands with our guests. The boys moved forward, heads down, hands up, in a gesture very like surrender and despair. Their limp fins were pumped by the gentleman and then by the lacy lady. Aaron was first, and he turned away from the little girl, but the lady said, Aren't you going to say how do to my daughter? Aaron shuddered and surrendered his hand in the direction of the girl with the hidden face. Nothing happened. His lifeless sausages were not gripped or wrung or squeezed or ratcheted. His hand simply hung in the air in front of her. Aaron peeked up through his eyelashes to see what was going on. Her head was down too and she had the advantage of the sunbonnet. Her small right hand with a signet ring on the middle finger was stuck out too but it made no move toward Aaron's hand. He stole a glance at the lady. She was smiling, her lips parted. The room seemed crushed with silence, and then Aaron heard a ripping snicker from Cal. Aaron reached out and grabbed her hand and pumped it up and down three times. It was as soft as a handful of petals. He felt a pleasure that burned him. He dropped her hand and concealed his in his overall pocket. As he backed hastily away, he saw Cal step up and shake hands formally and say, How do? Aaron had forgotten to say it, so he had now after his brother, and it sounded strange. Adam and his guests laughed. Adam said, Mr. and Mrs. Bacon nearly got caught in the rain. We were lucky to be lost here, Mr. Bacon said. I was looking for the Long Ranch. That's farther. You should have taken the next left turn off the country road to the south. Adam continued to the boys. Mr. Bacon is a county supervisor. I don't know why, but I take the job very seriously, said Mr. Bacon, and he too addressed the boys. My daughter's name is Abra, boys. Isn't that a funny name? He used the tone adults employ with children. He turned to Adam and said in poetic sing-song, Abra was ready ere I called her name, and though I called another, Abra came. Matthew Pryor, I won't say I hadn't wanted a son, but Abra is such a comfort. Look up, dear. Abra did not move. Her hands were again clasped in her lap. Her father repeated with relish, And though I called another, Abra came. Aaron saw his brother looking at the little sunbonnet with an ounce of fear, and Aaron said hoarsely, I don't think Abra's a funny name. He didn't mean funny that way, Mrs. Bacon explained. He only meant curious. And she explained to Adam, My husband gets the strangest things out of books. Dear, shouldn't we be going? Adam said eagerly, Oh, don't go yet, ma'am. Lee is making some tea. It will warm you up. Well, how pleasant, Mrs. Bacon said, and she continued, Children, it isn't raining anymore. Go outside and play. Her voice had such authority that they filed out, Aaron first and Cal second and Abra following. In the living room, Mr. Bacon crossed his legs. You have a fine prospect here, he said. Is it a sizable piece? Adam said, I have a good strip. I crossed the river to the other side. It's a good piece. That's all yours across the county road then. Yes, it is. I'm kind of ashamed to admit it. I've let it go badly. I haven't farmed it at all. Maybe I got too much farming as a child. Both Mr. and Mrs. Bacon were looking at Adam now, and he knew he had to make some explanation for letting his good land run free. He said, I guess I'm a lazy man, and my father didn't help me when he left me enough to get along on without working. He dropped his eyes, but he could feel the relief on the part of the Bacons. It was not laziness. He was a rich man. Only the poor were lazy, just as only the poor were ignorant. A rich man who didn't know anything was spoiled or independent. Who takes care of the boys? Mrs. Bacon asked. Adam laughed. What taking care of they get, and it isn't much, is Lee's work. Lee? Adam became a little irritated with the questioning. I only have one man, he said shortly. You mean the Chinese we saw? Mrs. Bacon was shocked. Adam smiled at her. She had frightened him at first, but now he was more comfortable. Lee raised the boys, and he has taken care of me, he said. But didn't they ever have a woman's care? No, they didn't. The poor lambs, she said. 
They're wild, but I guess they're healthy, Adam said. I guess we've all gone wild like the land. But now Lee is going away. I don't know what we'll do. Mr. Bacon carefully cleared the phlegm from his throat so it wouldn't be run over by his pronouncement. Have you thought about education of your sons? No, I guess I haven't thought about it much, Mrs. Bacon said. My husband is a believer in education. Education is the key to the future, Mr. Bacon said. What kind of education? asked Adam. Mr. Bacon went on. All things come to men who know. Yes, I'm a believer in the torch of learning. He leaned close and his voice became confidential. So long as you aren't going to farm your land, why don't you rent it and move to the county seat near our good public schools? For just a second, Adam thought of saying, why don't you mind your own goddamn business? But instead, he asked, you think that would be a good idea? I think I could get you a reliable tenant, Mr. Bacon said. No reason why you shouldn't have something coming in from your land if you don't live on it. Lee made a great stir coming in with the tea. He had heard enough of the tones through the door to be sure Adam was finding them tiresome. Lee was pretty certain they didn't like tea, and if they did, they weren't likely to favor the kind he had brewed. And when they drank it with compliments, he knew that the Bacons had their teeth in something. Lee tried to catch Adam's eye, but could not. Adam was studying the rug between his feet. Mrs. Bacon was saying, My husband has served on his school board for many years. But Adam didn't hear the discussion that followed. He was thinking of a big globe of the world, suspended and swaying from a limb of one of his oak trees. And for no reason at all that he could make out, his mind leaped to his father, stumping about on his wooden leg, rapping on his leg for attention with a walking stick. Adam could see the stern and military face of his father as he forced his sons through drill and made them carry heavy packs to develop their shoulders. Through his memory, Mrs. Bacon's voice droned on. Adam felt the pack loaded with rocks. He saw Charles's face grinning sardonically. Charles, the mean, fierce eyes, the hot temper. Suddenly, Adam wanted to see Charles. He would take a trip, take the boys. He slapped his leg with excitement. Mr. Bacon paused in his talk. I beg your pardon? Oh, I'm sorry, Adam said. I just remembered something I've neglected to do. Both Bacons were patiently, politely waiting for his ex exclamation. Explanation. Adam thought, why not? I'm not running for supervisor. I'm not on the school board. Why not? He said to his guest, I just remembered that I have forgotten to write to my brother for over 10 years. They shuddered under his statement and exchanged glances. Lee had been refilling the teacups. Adam saw his cheeks puff out and heard his happy snort as he passed to the safety of the hallway. The Bacons didn't want to comment on the incident. They wanted to be alone to discuss it. Lee anticipated that it would be this way. He hurried out to harness up and bring the rubber-tired buggy to the front door. When Abra and Cal and Aaron went out, they stood side by side on the small covered porch, looking at the rain splashing and dripping down from the wide-spreading oak trees. The cloudburst had passed into a distant echoing thunder roll, but it had left a rain determined to go on for a long time. Aaron said, That lady told us the rain was stopped. Abra answered him wisely. She didn't look. What she, when she's talking, she never looks. Cal demanded, how old are you? Ten, going on eleven, said Abra. Ho, huh, said Cal, we're eleven, going on twelve. Abra pushed her sunbonnet back. It framed her head like a halo. She was pretty, with dark hair and two braids. Her little forehead was round and domed, and her brows were level. One day her nose would be sweet and turned up, where now it was still button form. But two features would be with her always. Her chin was firm, and her mouth was as sweet as a flower, and very wide and pink. Her hazel eyes were sharp and intelligent and completely fearless. She looked straight into the faces of the boys, straight into their eyes, one after the other, and there was no hint of the shyness she had pretended inside the house. "'I don't believe you're twins,' she said. "'You don't look alike.' "'We are two, said Cal. "'We are two, said Aaron. Some twins don't look alike, Cal insisted. 
Lots of them don't, Aaron said. Lee told us how it is. If the lady has one egg, the twins look alike. If she has two eggs, they don't. We're two eggs, said Cal. Abra smiled with amusement at the myths of these country boys. Eggs, she said. How, oh, eggs? She didn't say it loudly or harshly, but Lee's theory tottered and swayed, and then she brought it crashing down. Which one of you is fried, she asked, and which one of you is poached? The boys exchanged uneasy glances. It was their first experience with the inexorable logic of women, which is overwhelming even, or perhaps especially, when it is wrong. This was new to them, exciting and frightening. Cal said, Lee is a Chinaman. Oh, well, said Abra kindly, why don't you say so? Maybe you're China eggs then, like they put in a nest. She paused to let her shaft sink in. She saw opposition, struggle, disappear. Abra had taken control. She was the boss. Aaron suggested, let's go to the old house and play there. It leaks a little, but it's nice. They ran under the dripping oaks to the old Sanchez house and plunged in through its open door, which squeaked restlessly on rusty hinges. The Dolby house had entered its second decay. The great sala all along the front was half plastered, the line of white halfway around and then stopping, just as the workmen had left it over ten years before. And the deep windows with their rebuilt sashes remained glassless. The new floor was streaked with water stain, and a clutter of old papers and darkened nail bags, with their nails rusted to prickly balls, filled the corner of the room. As the children stood in the entrance, a bat flew from the rear of the house. The gray shape swooped from side to side and disappeared through the doorway. The boys conducted Abra through the house, open closets to show wash basins and toilets and chandeliers, still crated and waiting to be installed. A smell of mildew and of wet paper was in the air. The three children walked on tiptoe, and they did not speak for fear of the echoes from the walls of the empty house. Back in the big sala, the twins faced their guest. Do you like it? Aaron asked softly because of the echo. Yes, she admitted hesitantly. Sometimes we play here, Cal said boldly. You can come here and play with us if you like. I live in Salinas, Abra said in such a tone that they knew they were dealing with a superior being who hadn't had time for bumpkin pleasures. Abra saw that she had crushed their highest treasure, and while she knew the weakness of men, she still liked them, and besides, she was a lady. Sometimes, when we are driving by, I'll come and play with you, a little, she said kindly, and both boys felt grateful to her. I'll give you my rabbit, said Cal suddenly. I was going to give it to my father, but you can have it. What rabbit? The one we shot today, right through the heart with an arrow. He hardly even kicked. Aaron looked at him in outrage. It was my... Cal interrupted. We will let you have it to take home. It's a pretty big one. Abra asked. What would I want with a dirty old rabbit all covered with blood? Aaron said, I'll wash him off and put him in a box and tie him with string. And if you don't want to eat him, you can have a funeral when you get time. In Salinas. I go to real funerals, said Abra. Went to one yesterday. There was flowers high as this roof. Don't you want a rabbit? Aaron asked. Abra looked at his sunny hair, tight curled now, and at his eyes that seemed near to tears. And she felt the longing and the itching burn in her chest that is the beginning of love. Also, she wanted to touch Aaron, and she did. She put her hand on his arm and felt him shiver under her fingers. If you put him in a box, she said. Now that she had got herself in charge, Abra looked around and inspected her conquests. She was well above vanity now that no male principal threatened her. She felt kindly toward these boys. She noticed their thin, washed-out clothes patched here and there by Lee. She drew on her fairy tales. You poor children, she said. Does your father beat you? They shook their heads. They were interested, but bewildered. Are you very poor? How do you mean? Cal asked. Do you sit in the ashes and have to fetch water and faggots? What's faggots? Aaron asked. She avoided that by continuing. Poor darlings, she began, and she seemed to herself to have a little wand in her hand tipped by a twinkling star. Does your wicked stepmother hate you and want to kill you? We don't have a stepmother, said Cal. 
We don't have any kind, said Aaron. Our mother's dead. His words destroyed the story she was writing, but almost immediately supplied her with another. The wand was gone, but she wore a big hat with an ostrich plume, and she carried an enormous basket from which a turkey's feet protruded. Little motherless orphans, she said sweetly. I'll be your mother. I'll hold you and rock you and tell you stories. We're too big, said Cal. We'd overset you. Abra looked away from his brutality. Aaron, she saw, was caught up in her story. His eyes were smiling, and he seemed almost to be rocking in her arms, and she felt again the tug of love for him. She said pleasantly, Tell me, did your mother have a nice funeral? We don't remember, said Aaron. We were too little. Well, where is she buried? You could put flowers on her grave. We always do that for Grandma and Uncle Albert. We don't know, said Aaron. Cal's eyes had a new interest, a gleaming interest that was so close to triumph. He said naively, I'll ask our father where it is so we can take flowers. I'll go with you, said Abra. I can make a wreath. I'll show you how. She noticed that Aaron had not spoken. Don't you want to make a wreath? Yes, he said. She had to touch him again. She patted his shoulder and then touched his cheek. Your mama would like that, she said. Even in heaven they look down and notice. My father says they do. He knows a poem about it. Aaron said, I'll go wrap up the rabbit. I've got the box my pants came in. He ran out of the old house. Cal watched him go. He was smiling. What are you laughing at? Abra asked. Oh, nothing, he said. Cal's eyes stayed on her. She tried to stare him down. She was an expert at staring down, but Cal did not look away. At very first, he had felt a shyness, but that was gone now, and the sense of triumph at destroying Abra's control made him laugh. He knew she preferred his brother, but that was nothing new to him. Nearly everyone preferred Aaron with his golden hair and the openness that allowed his affection to plunge like a puppy. Cal's emotions hid deep in him and peered out, ready to retreat or attack. He was starting to punish Abra for liking his brother, and this was nothing new either. He had done it since he first discovered he could, and secret punishment had grown to be almost a creative thing with him. Maybe the difference between the boys can be best described in this way. If Aaron should come upon an anthill and a little clearing in the brush, he would lie on his stomach and watch the complications of ant life. He would see some of them bringing food in the ant roads and others carrying the white eggs. He would see how two members of the hill on meeting put their antennas together and talked. For hours, he would lie absorbed in the economy of the ground. If, on the other hand, Cal came up upon the same ant hill, he would kick it to pieces and watch while the frantic ants took care of their disaster. Aaron was content to be part of his world, but Cal must change it. Cal did not question the fact that people liked his brother better, but he had developed a means for making it all right with himself. He planned and waited until one time that admiring person exposed himself, and then something happened and the victim never knew how or why. Out of revenge, Cal extracted a fluid of power, and out of power, joy. It was the strongest, purest emotion he knew. Far from disliking Aaron, he loved him because he was usually the cause for Cal's feelings of triumph. He had forgotten, if he had ever known, that he punished because he wished he could be loved as Aaron was loved. It had gone so far that he preferred what he had to do that he had to what Aaron had. Abra had started a process in Cal by touching Aaron and by the softness of her voice toward him. Cal's reaction was automatic. His brain probed for a weakness in Abra, and so clever was he that he found one almost at once in her words. Some children want to be babies and some want to be adults. Few are content with their age. Abra wanted to be an adult. She used adult words and stimulated, insofar as she was able, adult attitudes and emotions. She had left babyhood far behind, and she was not capable yet of being one of the grown-ups she admired. Cal sensed this, and it gave him the instrument to knock down her ant hill. He knew about how long it would take his brother to find the box. He could see in his mind what would happen. Aaron would try to wash the blood off the rabbit, and this would take time. Finding string would take more time, and the careful tying of the bow knot still more time. And meanwhile, Cal knew he was beginning to win. 
He felt Abra's certainty wavering, and he knew that he could prod it further. Abra looked away from him at last and said, What do you stare at a person for? Kel looked at her feet and slowly raised his eyes, going over her as coldly as if she were a chair. This, he knew, could even make an adult nervous. Abra couldn't stand it. She said, See anything green? Cal asked, Do you go to school? Of course I do. What grade? Hi, fifth. How old are you? Going on eleven. Cal laughed. What's wrong with that? She demanded. He didn't answer her. Come on, tell me, what's wrong with that? Still no answer. You think you're mighty smart, she said. And when he continued to laugh at her, she said uneasily, I wonder what's taking your brother so long. Look, the rain stopped. Cal said, I guess he's looking around for it. You mean for the rabbit? Oh no, he's got that all right, it's dead. But maybe he can't catch the other. It gets away. Catch what? What gets away? He wouldn't want me to tell, said Cal. He wants it to be a surprise. He caught it last Friday. It bit him too. Whatever are you talking about? You'll see, said Cal, when you open the box. I bet he tells you not to open it right off. This was not a guess. Cal knew his brother. Abra knew she was losing not only the battle, but the whole war. She began to hate this boy. In her mind, she went over the deadly retorts he knew and gave them all up in helplessness, feeling they would have no effect. She retired into silence. She walked out of the door and looked toward the house where her parents were. I think I'll go back, she said. Wait, said Cal. She turned as he came up with her. What do you want? she asked coldly. Don't be mad with me, he said. You don't know what goes on here. You should see my brother's back. His change of pace bewildered her. He never let her get set in an attitude, and he had properly read her interest in romantic situations. His voice was low and secret. She lowered her voice to match his. What do you mean? What's wrong with his back? All scars, said Cal. It's the Chinaman. She shivered and tensed with interest. What does he do? Does he beat him? Worse than that, said Cal. Why don't you tell your father? We don't dare. Do you know what would happen if we told? No. What? He shook his head. No, he seemed to think carefully. I don't even dare tell you. At that moment, Lee came from the shed, leading the bacon's horse hitched to the high spindly rig with rubber tires. Mr. and Mrs. Bacon came out of the house, and automatically they all looked up at the sky. Cal said, I can't tell you now. The Chinaman would know if I told. Mrs. Bacon called. Abra, hurry, we're going. Lee held the rest of horse while Mrs. Bacon was helped up into the rig. Aaron came dashing around the house, carrying a cardboard box intricately, intricately tied with string and fancy bow knots. He thrust it at Abra. Here, he said. Don't untie it until you get home. Cal saw revulsion on Abra's face. Her hands shrank away from the box. Take it, dear, her father said. Hurry, we're very late. He thrust the box into her hand. Cal stepped close to her. I want to whisper, he said. He put his mouth to her ear. You've wet your pants, he said. She blushed and pulled the sunbonnet up over her head. Mrs. Bacon picked her up and under the arms and passed her into the buggy. Lee and Adam and the twins watched the horse pick up a fine trot. Before the first turn, Abra's hand came up and the box went sailing backward into the road. Cal watched his brother's face and saw misery come into Aaron's eyes. When Adam had gone back into the house and Lee was moving out with a pan of grain to feed the chickens, Cal put his arm around his brother's shoulders and hugged him reassuringly. I wanted to marry her, Aaron said. I put a letter in the box, asking her. Don't be sad, said Cal. I'm going to let you use my rifle. Aaron's head jerked around. You haven't got a rifle. Haven't I? Cal said. Haven't I, though? Thanks for joining me for tonight's edition of Booked for the Night. I'll be back tomorrow night with more of East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Until then, thanks for listening, and good night.